Welcome to the Online Literary Festival um, Bookbound 2020, which offers a global platform for established writers, emerging authors, and all lovers of literature. We can come together at this period of international uncertainty and isolation and benefit from the conversations that we can generate with each other. I'm Susan Rudy, and I'm director of the Centre for Poetry at Queen Mary, University of London. Um, I'm so pleased to be hosting the conversation you're about to hear because it was my pleasure just this week to um, have a, a sort of very quick introduction and wonderful introduction to the work of Emma Glass and Margarita Garcia Robayo. Um, you will find, I hope soon, that um, Emma's books Peach, just published in 2018, and her forthcoming book, Rest and Be Thankful, which is about to appear this year, as well as uh, a translation in English by Charlotte Coombe um, of two of Margarita Garcia Robayo's books, A Fish Soup, uh, 2018, and Holiday Heart, forthcoming this year as well. Um, in these books, Emma and Margarita are creating very powerful new voices in international writing in English. As you're about to hear, their works emerge out of productive exper experimentation with the conjunctions between the novella and something very close to poetry. So let's listen in now as these two um, maestros of the novella form, that's absolutely for sure, uh, discuss many things. We are going to begin by looking at the forms that they employ in their work, um, then talk a bit about the reclamation of very rarely heard women's voices in their narratives. Um, the challenges of writing and publishing in the time of coronavirus, and something about their writing for the future, particularly in the form of their forthcoming books. So let's just begin with Emma. Emma, could you tell us a bit about the forms that you employ in your work? Because it's very different between what you're doing in Peach and what you're doing in the book is just about to appear, uh, Rest and Be uh, Thankful. Um, and then um, right after that, Margarita, you could just move straight in with your comments in response to what Emma has to say and what you'd like to say about your own work. Emma, when you're ready. Uh, so I'll start with Peach, uh, which, as you mentioned, came out in 2018. Um, Peach was actually uh, my um, project that I was writing at university when I was studying literature. And um, I, it was sort of born of this exasperation with traditional storytelling. Um, I'll try and explain that a little bit. So uh, I'm, I'm really inspired by sort of unique voices, um, particularly writers like Gertrude Stein, um, who takes an entirely experimental approach to um, to poetry and 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 to prose, um, and also James Joyce. Uh, the stream of consciousness is what really fascinates me in his work. Um, so when I was writing Peach, I was really just trying to write something that would be um, a visceral experience. So not just a story, but something that the reader would be able to feel inside. They'd be able to sort of carry it with them as they follow the, 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 the narrative. And then the, the narrative is spoken from um, the perspective of a young girl. Um, and I sort of, I'm really also very fascinated with surrealism. So, uh, she's a girl or is she a peach you know everything around her takes on it on, on a new function her boyfriend is a, is a tree her baby brother is a, a, a jelly baby but um i really love this idea that there that there are different readings into that so i like the, <laughs> i like a very sort of um sort of pig-headed sort of view of that you know i'm very when people ask me oh what does it mean what does it mean is it a metaphor i'm very determined that no it's not what if it just is let's open up our imaginations and it just is um and then in my second novel rest and be thankful which is a little less um experimental in the sense that it, it follows another um young woman's story but uh she's a nurse so i'm i'm a nurse in in real life as well um and what i wanted to do with rest and be thankful is uh again sort of ha create an experience for the reader, um, a very sort of claustrophobic experience of what it's like to work a string of shifts and just to be for, for a short period of time utterly consumed with what you're doing um, and how you're doing it for others. Um, and so both of the novels are very short and that's partly because I don't have a very long attention span. <laughs> I like to um, I like to finish things. I like to sort of close the loop very quickly, and I'm quite unforgiving in 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 that sense. Um, I I you know I, I think it's a it's a real 
particularly in the time that we are now, it feels like a real achievement to finish reading a book. Um, you know, even, even if it's just to, to say, I have read something, I've finished it, I've accomplished it. And so I always feel that when I, when I read um, short novels, they feel like these little short, sharp bursts of victory. <laughs> um, but with, with Rest and Be Thankful in particular, um, so the nurse is named Laura and she's on a string of night shifts and she sort of flits between um, uh, sleep and wake and there's always that uncertainty that um, even though she's going about her, her day, you're never really sure whether she's dreaming it or whether it's real or not. Um, and it all kind of sort of bubbles up um, and then really brutally cuts off at the end, <laughs> just as the action's about to start. But I think there's something really impactful in those kind of short, sharp endings. Mm -hmm. what, 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 what do you, how do you respond to, to what Emma said, Margarita? Yes, uh, I love the, the conception uh, uh, that Emma just explained very well about books being an experience because I, I really think that as a reader and as a writer but but as a reader like mostly because I, I love books that hit me hard you know I, I love those kind of of shocking experience and I really believe that books um, can do that in, in, in the like in a very amazing way more than any other uh, area of, of creation and about the structure I when, when I think of what I do I, I like to think about like a thin short line with with lots, lots of depth of field as you say like in painting or, or photography um, I like uh, simple stories loaded with this extreme necessity or need to, to say something um, meaningful and complex, which for me, obviously, but that isn't, um, oh, usually those things that I want to say, those kind of subjects aren't easy or most of the time they are not happy or nice or pleasant. They're like things that that kind of um, are difficult to, to express. So these simple stories are the way I used to canalize those um, hard topics, you know? Mm -hmm. So I need them to be like uh, abarcables, like abarcables, how do you say? Like, yes, simple, so people can get into them and, and feel whatever I, I, I want them to feel, but without so what I'm trying to say is that I don't care that much about plot, you know, about the plot itself. I care more um, about treatment, being, being treatment, like trying to, to, to look for the most powerful and shocking images, hopefully described with beautiful language. Mm -hmm. And that's that's really interesting what you say about you're not interested in plot because that's um, that's what really inspired me to write Peach. So whilst I was studying at university, the module I was studying was um, the the modern novel, and um, our seminars were sort of geared towards uh, the planning the novels and discussing the character development and the plot development and we were learning you know really useful um tips and tricks on how to keep your reader interested but uh when it came to actually sitting down and saying right what is my story about for me that was the brick wall i didn't know i didn't know i have no idea what it was about and even now when i think about rest and when i think about peach i don't know what they're about but what i did know was the voice what i did feel um was the language that's what I, I knew what i wanted to do with the words and actually what the characters did and how this, the plot developed was very secondary and some of the feedback i got from my lecturer when i sort of sent her my idea and and, and showed her the first kind of few thousand words was um she was like this can only because of the style of writing because you know it's very lyrical and poetic she said this is only going to take you a certain you know to a, to a certain number of words in a word count of a novel at some point the story has to emerge and although 
you know, I, 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 I took on board what she said. I actually like didn't care. I just had this hunger to paint this picture. Um, and what, what came out of it uh, was really surprising. And, you know, uh, Peach is a very sort of, it's very grotesque and, you know, there's some body horror in it and there are some, there's a lot of violence in it but it's not at all what I expected it to be. And when people say, you've written a book about violence against women, and I'm like, <laughs> it sounds really stupid, but I, I do have that kind of, that it was shocking for me because I was so focused on, as Margarita says, that the, the, the beautiful depiction of the images and, and how that would feel to the reader. It really surprised me when people start to categorize it into themes. Um, and still surprises me now when we just say, oh, I, you know, I read this theme and I, I was thinking about this when I was reading it. And it's really fascinating. And actually, it's only having readers um, that, that's actually turned my work into a story. <laughs> that's so interesting. Margarita, do you feel that way about your work too? About the sort of, that you hear from your readers what your work is about in a way that you didn't see yourself? Always, always. Um, it's kind of uh, shocking, as Emma says, and uh, said, and, and surprising always what people have to say about about your own work. Because I think that that we are so immersed in 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 what we are talking about in our own uh, concerns, you know. Because I feel like writing is also putting down our concerns about the world using those. Uh, um, like shortcuts that are finally the plot for me plot is a shortcut for so you can you know it lets um, out those concerns so you are so immersed in those things that you are observing and thinking about that you you don't have like the the time for looking up and uh, kind of of uh, say well as, as, a, as a reader you always like kind of with a pencil you read a book and you are like um, underlining uh, and with your own work you, you can't do that you just put it there <laughs> so the other ones are, are the ones who, who can point oh you are talking about um, loneliness oh yes I am but you you have never you know like realized that in that um, like certain and, and um, certain way, you know. Yeah. And I, I want to say something else. Oh, but but you are going to ask another question, sorry. Well, no, carry on, because what you're saying is really interesting. We can move from there. What were you going to say? No, no. That uh, hearing Emma, I, I I think about what if I, you know, if I can choose something uh, to focus in writing. I really like to. I prefer like finding them you know like i prefer like rather than i've enjoyed much more like this kind of a structure than than endless novels obviously this is a generalization but There would be those ones, that ones that that have like this, that, that look for the essence more than the expansion, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think that what I'm trying to look in in my uh, writing is is for the essence and and get rid of any other distraction mm -hmm. that make me go away from what I'm really trying to say here. Yeah, maybe that's one of the marks of, you know, literary text, that the writer has to feel focused on what is most important for her to say, not what the readers want. Although, you know, there's something I think especially poignant about a readership for women writers. Um, and there's a way in which women, the subject matter for women's writing is expected to be very narrow and it's expected to be about your lives in ways that we don't expect of, you know, male writers certainly haven't expected it historically. And I wonder if you, either of you feel constrained by that or enabled by that. I mean, there's a way in which your work is being read because it's clicking into a kind of zeitgeist around women's experience at the moment that, you know, has readers attached to it. Any thoughts in that kind of space around the, you know, the fact that you're writing from the perspective of women and very particular, very caring, very feminine women in a way, vulnerable women. Um, that's 
that's something that I was drawn to in both of your work too. Either of you? <laughs> <laughs> um, sure. Um, so I think when um, for Peach, when I when I got to the the crux of what that story is about, it's you know it's about a young girl who's um, she's sexually assaulted and um, she doesn't tell anyone. Uh, she's she's entirely the silent victim, but she uh, decides to take her own revenge and um, in a very sort of violent way. And um, a lot of people have remarked on the the violence in the book, and and you know sort of asked the question how necessary how necessary is that, and and also how realistic is that. Um, one of the reasons why I employ the surrealist elements and sort of the poetic language is um, to make this as far away from any uh, human experience as possible, but also to give her um, absolute justification for the violence that she uh, decides to commit. I want there to be no other option for her so that she acts. And I think what I was trying to do there is was was trying to um, give voice to the physicality of pain. So you know there there are um, there are lots of, of 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 works of literature and and works of no, um, nonfiction as well about women who have have suffered in in that way. And since the Me Too movement, um, it's incredible what's emerged and how many people feel now able to speak about their experiences. But it's you know there's so much focus and emphasis on. Um, the survivorship of women, which is really important, and also the psychological impact that 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 sort of level um, of of hurt can do to somebody. But what I wanted to do was put the the physical pain um, at the forefront and say um, and and give a voice to those women who have experienced. Um, that that kind of physical violation and say this is what we need to start saying and these are the words that we need to use to say them because otherwise if we don't talk about the reality of it uh, although it is horrific and awful the more the, the quieter we remain about it the less people will understand what that's like and you know that's a really kind of difficult <laughs> difficult thing to say as um a young woman's writer and what I found in 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 trying to say that is people will um, not not necessarily readers uh, but you know people who read the book to review it or um, to write pieces about it you know that they they, they they kind of want to know very explicitly am I talking about myself is it my experience and that seems really important to people I guess what they're hungering for is authenticity but um, you know, it's something that makes me very vulnerable as a writer um, and something that I've had to be very clear about. Was no Peach's experience isn't necessarily my exact experience, but what I am putting language to is my, my, own, my, my own trauma. It happens in a different way. Everyone has trauma. But um, the, the fact that people have to ask those questions, what is it about that authenticity? Um, but, you know, of course, it's not... Um, it's not true to life, you know, she's, she's a piece of fruit for goodness sake, <laughs> but, but that, that's not to belittle what the message is, it's just trying to give it another dynamic and actually make it um, more, <laughs> I hate the food and fruit pun, but to make it more digestible um, for people to understand. And then for, for with, with my, my current novel, Rest and Be Thankful, because it is about a nurse and I am a nurse and I have drawn on very personal and professional experiences as inspiration, the questions do keep coming, is this you? Um, and I'm just fascinated by the motive behind that question. Will it be any less a piece of literature if I was a vet <laughs> or worked in a supermarket? Um, but yeah, Wanda Margarita, what do you what do you think about that? Do you get asked a lot about whether your writing is your own experience, and do you get asked to justify authenticity? Uh, that's, I 
it's very um, curious, you know, people find very hard to believe uh, in fiction. <laughs> I don't know, like, it's like what we do, and they have like very, like poor faith in fiction. They, they just think that writers are like looking around and taking notes and just writing just what they, like, like as, as, how do you say, um, not anthropologists, but those ethno ethnographers, we say it in Spanish. Ethnographers, like, yeah. Ethnographers, that they just like write down the candidates and, and, and make lists, those people who make lists. Uh, yes, it's always the same with every book, if, even if I, I, I used to say that sometimes, well, I'm, I'm the kind of, of writer that, that took the experience. Yes, um, I use experience a lot. That doesn't mean that uh, that it's like it's me in the books, and I'm talking always about a husband, and it's my husband, and mother, and it's my mother. It's like very like annoying uh, hearing this question that keep going coming back. But but um, oh, I get lost. I, yes, I used experience. That was uh, I was saying, but. Um, I forget what I was going to say, sorry. What's your personal <laughs> experience? And I just get lost because I said husband and I heard my husband there like yelling. Um, so, um, well, I'm going to go with the woman's uh, topic because I just, I know it, it goes, it goes away, my idea. It was a very brilliant idea. <laughs> well, um, so, uh, women. In my case, I, well, I, starting from the fact that I really think that being woman, woman is being vulnerable, but that doesn't mean helpless or weak, you know, it's, it, I, so when we write about woman characters, in, in my case, for example, I, my characters are usually women um, who like inhabit places in which they feel uncomfortable and misunderstood always. But the tricky things, thing about this is, is that those places are familiar to them. Those, are, those places are their homes. So they're like women who feel like a stranger among relatives or among friends or very close people. And that's kind of disturbing. You know? like feeling I don't belong here but I do because I born here and my family is here and whatever so this is like the the, the ambiguity or the contradiction of, of these characters and what what I really think that I'm talking about when I write about those uh, women is uh, misplacing maybe because they are always like looking for that place that physical or symbolic place to feel um, uh, comfortable and, and understood uh, just to realize most of the time that that place for those kind of women doesn't exist or at least it um, isn't available for them. Um, so I don't know. Specific to your generation of women, I'm, I mean, I'm very moved by the way you two do it. But you know, I come, I'm quite a lot older than both of you. And when I was your age, you know, the notion that to be a, a woman would was was to be a strong woman, you know, and actually to identify with men more, and to not admit vulnerability, and to not identify as mothers or caregivers. You know, I think that was a generational shift that actually has happened between women who were sort of. Um, coming of age in the 80s and 90s and the women who you know have come of age in the early 21st century and I, I think it's really important to claim the strength you know, despite the vulnerability and to also see the strength in vulnerability um, and you know your characters are nurses and mothers and these are extremely important figures in in society and and we haven't heard enough about what it feels like to be inside those spaces and you're both exploring them with such complex stories that I, I really was moved by them, to be honest. Did you want to say anything else about what, what um, Margarita has just said, Emma? Um, yeah, I was thinking just about, um, so, so 
women's roles and what I wanted to do with both of my books um, is to to give voice to women in despair. Um, I'm, I'm Welsh and uh, I, I've inherited a particular kind of stoicism <laughs> from, uh, from my mother, but also just kind of from, from, from my heritage. And um, actually the reason I'm a nurse is because um, I was told that uh, it wouldn't be possible to be a successful, female writer it wouldn't be something that um you know and i i don't mean like specifically bias but you know some person but that gen you know there's a there and, and and even now i hear it there and even now i partly um i don't i don't say it but uh there is particularly publishing a book now it is really challenging if we're thinking about um just purely from the financial perspective um, of trying to be a writer it's it's harder for women naturally um, but I, you know the reason I'm a nurse is because I was told that it would be nearly impossible for me to become a writer or work in the publishing industry unless I had connections or you know unless I had real talent <laughs> um, you know there is a there is like a general discourse about that even now this was you know i i, I was um at i graduated from university 2000 2008 so you know this is a long time ago still um and that 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 thought it's still with me and it still frightens me um even with a pub, you know a publishing deal and two novels under my belt this idea that i might uh quit my job that pays my rent um, to really take a punt at it, it's, it scares me. It really scares me. I feel like I'm getting closer. Um, but, you know, I, I nurse because I have to have um, a function. You know, I, I have to be able to justify my space in the world. And it's something that brings me joy, but also something that really helps with my creativity and um is really inspirational and you know I, I get to be part of a thousand different families you know with every every child I look after I become part of that family I have such a um, such a privileged and unique insight into other people's lives uh, I don't want to give that <laughs> I don't want to give that up but also it's not possible for me to give that up right now because you have to eat and you have to put a roof over your head but um, it is always that question, isn't it? I mean, if I had unlimited time and money, what what would I be capable of producing? I sort of joked earlier about why I write short novels because I don't have much of an attention span, but from a very practical point of view, it's that ability to complete something. Um, you know, you hear of novels taking 10 decades to write and they end up being these sprawling, um, ethics which you know I have such respect for and it's so wonderful that people have an ability to create a world you know massive world with in some cases its own language what I'm really excited about being able to do is creating as equal equally vivid a world but in that tiny tiny capsule mm -hmm. the um, American poet Adrian Rich she uh, had a, a series she wrote in the 1960s called snapshots of a daughter-in-law and it was written at these chunks of time between looking after her three young children. And she didn't think of it as poetry at first, you know, she just thought of it as scribbling. Uh, and it became a very important poem. And obviously she's a very significant uh, woman writer, 20th century woman writer. Margarita, does that resonate with you? Yes, I'm not a nurse, but- You have but two I'm small children. You know? <laughs> children, and so I do caring also. Uh, Lucia Berlin was also an, a nurse, no? Lucia Berlin, have you read her? Mm -mm. Oh, oh, oh yes, 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 Hello. Lucia Berlin. I have her short story collection, yes. I didn't know she was a nurse. <laughs> yes. At some point of, of her life, because she was like everything, you know? She was a maid, she was a nurse, she was a mom, she was a, everything. Um, but yes, I, I, I believe that uh, being a again it's it's like anachronic but really being a woman and being a writer a writer is it's like having 
three or four jobs at the times and, and, and being a writer is not a job. It's that, that is the, the tricky thing. It's not a job because it's a job because you sit down and use your keyboard and produce something, but that doesn't always traduce into coins. You know, it, you, you don't earn money immediately and, or, or maybe you don't earn money. It's, it's like that. <laughs> So you have to do something else if you are not rich, as Virginia Woolf, for example, who was great, but she really had plenty of time. And she, well, I, I read a book um, about, it's, it's called Against um, Sons, Against Sons. Uh, it, uh, she, the writer is a uh, Chilean girl, Dina Meruane, she really, it's, really good but this book particularly focus on on why right women writers um aren't mothers most of them in the history it's like it's really rare you know um because because of that basically because they have to have a job so they can keep you know eating and living and surviving and then they have a second job which is the writing, and then if you have children, that's a full-time job always. So you don't have uh, the opportunity to, to you know, you don't have time to have an, another job, you know, and and that's really hard. I don't know. I really don't know how. I don't have the answer for that. It it really like um, worries me a, a lot because sometimes I say, well okay, I quit writing, I, I, I won't write anymore, I, I don't have time, I don't have the concentration for that, but I just can't, I, I really can't, when, when, when my children are asleep, I, I, well, while I, you have to resignate something, I said always, and I resignate sleeping, so when they are asleep, I just like sit down and try to put some sentence together, and sometimes it becomes, it will become something, I guess, but it's kind of a, a, a um, how do you say, like an alley with no um, exit and a non-exit alley, <laughs> because we are always like in a loop looking for a way. And what we writers do, if, if we have children or we don't have children, it doesn't matter. We are always looking for jobs or scholarships or, or things that, that pays us the time but in that searching we waste our time so it's like something we don't have ever the time for sitting down and write and being like inspired and that does, doesn't exist at least for me but, and yet you've been so productive we have these two books in english but you have published many more books did you start publishing when you were what in your early 20s or what's your history around publishing? i started published very young i i regret that i really do i don't like my first book i like i hate it but well it was a, a way a way in you know and i started at 26 maybe i published my my first book and um and then, yes, I continue. I have, I was like very lucky because um, I, I used to work in a, in a, in a publisher house, um, like reading, being a reader, just a reader. And they give you this like um, formularios, formats. So you have to, to be, it's, it's, it's um, for children. No, it, it, did you like it? How much from one to two, this, this kind of mechanic reading, I, I did that. So I knew the editor and, and that's how I, I approach him and, and, and told him, well, I have some short stories. I said, yeah, send it to me. And, and, it, and it was like that very, it, I know that it's not usual, you know, like sometimes people, like send their manuscripts and they don't read it ever so i was i know that i was very lucky but the uh, writing but is very powerful too don't give that away <laughs> you know <laughs> lots of people have the opportunity to have someone read their work but not all work moves someone immediately and i i was moved very immediately by both of your work as i'm sure your editors have been what's your story about early publication like i know you wrote this manuscript peach long before you published it but how did it end up yeah. in 
I was also very lucky. <laughs> it's quite unusual to, to, to meet someone who has a sort of, not, not, not exactly similar, but, um, you know, I, the, most of the writers I meet have these very long, drawn out, difficult, <laughs> difficult entries that starts with an agent that then goes through, you know, their manuscript goes through many, many changes and then eventually um, they get a publishing deal. But I, I count myself very, very blessed. Um, I, so yes, I started writing Peach at university and um, I was determined that I would um, complete it and I would be a successful novelist and that would be my life. <laughs> you know, as a, as a, um, you know, I would have been 21 when I, when, when I was in that mindset. Um, and of course, when I graduated from university, my plan was to go back and um, complete a master's, complete the novel, and <laughs> that would be it. But I, uh, it was around the time of the recession that hit in 2008 and my hometown was struck very badly. Um, so my plan of getting a job through the summer to finance my master's didn't happen. Um, and within three, three weeks of moving back home, um, I, I just became really, really despondent and probably quite depressed actually to have all my freedom taken from me and then all my dream, you know, my, my, my future dreams taken from me as well. Um, so that was when I decided to become a nurse. So the writing went on hold. Uh, I went straight into a three year degree of nursing, uh, came out the other side and then went straight into um, a full time job at a big children's hospital in London. And it was when I moved to London that and, and started working that I realized that I needed some um, outlet for my uh, from from for my emotions because it was a really it was a, it was a shock <laughs> moving to London by myself um, and then nursing some of the the sickest children you know I've been a nurse ten years now and some of my experiences there were just it was really hard and um, so I start I turned back to writing and I decided that Peach was a load of rubbish and I wasn't going to go there anymore um, but I actually couldn't focus on anything I couldn't get her uh, the, the voice of Peach out of my head so I just started chipping away again um, you know and there was like five years between the start and then the restart and um, I sort of finished it within four months and thought I would just send it to um, an old university lecturer who had always been very encouraging um, and I just, just sent the most embarrassing email <laughs> I think I've ever sent in my life. How are you? Do you remember me? Um, just in case you're interested, this is what I was working on. And I finished it. And uh, he came back straight away and said, people need to read this. I need, to, I need people to read this. <laughs> and um, he asked if he could send it out for me because he knew that I, you know, I don't, I don't have that... Um, I, I couldn't face that that level of rejection that I hear about from from other writers. I don't have that um, that strength <laughs> to be told no over and over uh, because I had a strong feeling that it would be a no because Peach is very experimental and also the content is is, is heavy. Um, but he sent it out a couple of places and then I was asked to meet with an editor at Bloomsbury and we had a chat <laughs> and um, you know she said this is a big risk and we will only take the risk if the entire house is on board um, and they gave me a, an answer within a couple of weeks and 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 um, they gave me a two book deal which is just like <laughs> complete I, I still can't quite believe it to be honest and you know then through time um, after Peach was published, I got an agent who's um, really, really amazing uh, that I'm working with now. But it just, you know, the story, I guess, people go, oh, how did you do it? I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> Pure luck. Pure luck. I think that you shouldn't give away, you know, hard work and actually a lot of, well, you know, I, I bet a lot of effort. I don't know what you did, you know, when you were writing it, but both of your work really shows a lot of care and a lot of thought and a lot of work you know so don't give it away i don't think it's luck in either case you know <laughs> what about you margarita how did you go from that editor you were working with to the public publishing kind of deals lots of people like to hear these stories well no he just um read it and he told me yes i wanted to. i don't know it was really easy when people asked me it was like easy but I really don't have any expectation. That's what 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 happened back then. That and what I told I 
sometimes in, in when when we we could see people i used to have a work a workshop here in my in my house with people who is starting to to write and that and they come and and they are very worried about about pub, uh, publication you know and that's really not a good point of, of start you know because i always tell them that publication it's one of the many consequences that uh, a text uh, could have you know and it isn't the most important it, it isn't i am really convinced about that and now and now really i regret about my first book i don't like it people tell me oh it was great it was so fresh whatever and uh, but i'm i don't like it in my i i i, I don't reread it at all but when i think <laughs> of what i did back then i say this should have been like in, in, in when you put things in to wait in water and when you are to cook how do you say like in remojo we say in spanish you should have uh wait a bit more to be more like mature and, and, and that and that's why i always say to my students you know you have to give it time because because the, the things um that you write also have like trans transformations process in the inside while you leave it there and you won't believe it when you go back to them and reread it you find things that you didn't realize at, at, the, at the first time you you produce it so um it was easy but it really i don't find that like uh it's like a victory i i really don't i i would have um wanted to 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 wait a bit more uh, but well it happened that way and then uh, they published my, my next books and then i i moved from uh, to another publisher house always big ones i don't know why because really i think that uh, in english i i really find like a, a house that it's more uh, alike uh, in, to me like it's more like an indie way of making book and i like really love that um, but in spanish i'm uh, I, hopefully I, I hope that they don't hear this but they are like too big so it's penguin and and they are like wow. and i think that the kind of literature that i write it depends on the editor and it depends on the they have like different stages different collections and it depends on on what collection my book gets into but so now that i have written um, other books uh, they finally seem to understand that my kind of literature is more like a for um, a um, specific kind of public and not massive you know like not that commercial commercial at all so if you put my book uh, this uh, near um i don't know elena ferrante maybe uh, it would, would get like crushed but if you put it in the right collection and that maybe it would work better so i really appreciate what for example charco press and those kind of publisher houses are doing because I, I think that they care very much about about the content and they put it in the right places and that's it. I think that the book has to find its way and, and sometimes the way is, isn't the the flashing one mm -hmm. uh, but this but this one. Maybe this is a good time to talk then about the books that are just coming out and you know how they came to be in relationship to what you've already published or whatever story you want to tell about that and maybe give people a bit of a sense of what these books are about too so that they will want to read them maybe back to you emma um yeah i so i i was always really daunted by the idea of this the second novel the terrifying the tricky second novel and particularly publishing something like peach which is although very very small is very loud <laughs> and leaves an impression. It's really one of those you you love it or you you hate it sort of novels. So I I, I for a long time um, just built up this anxiety. You know what's next? What should I do next? And everything that I I started to write, I just felt like it was still 
too peach like you know i have this terror i'm just utterly terrified that i i have a one i'm a one trick pony it's just that one voice that will ever emerge but um i i sort of took um a slower approach with with rest and grounded it a lot more in you know the usual trick of write what you know um, but without without um i guess with still that focus on the language um it was a lot easier to tell this to tell the story of rest and be thankful because um it's actually based on a ghost story that i was told uh, on a night shift at um at the hospital i was working at when i first moved to london um we <laughs> but nurses are terrible they are nurses are terrible they're wonderful beings but also terrible we like to freak each other out and <laughs> tell creepy stories in like the worst possible um places imaginable um it's always a dark quiet hospital at night most people are on break or you know they're at the other end of the ward so you can't see them there's just a handful of us huddled around the nurse's station keeping watch or you know ha having a having a cup of tea and um this story comes out so uh <laughs> and I, I i tried to look it up afterwards to find the origins of it i've not been able to find it and, I, and now i sort of feel like it's a story that gets told on every children's ward in every hospital in the world um but basically there was was a, a, a nurse in um, at the time I was told it was in Victorian times um, a nurse on a night shift who was feeding a baby and um, she was so tired that she fell asleep and she dropped the baby and the baby died and she couldn't live with what she had done so she um, she threw herself off the top of the the stairwell in the nurse's home which at at the time was in the hospital and I was living in the nurse's home at the time so obviously I was terrified <laughs> um, and then uh, it, the, the legend has it that this nurse um, has been sighted you know on night shifts and it's you know rustling skirts and um, creepy white faces and you know she's uh, she said to pinch the shoulder of any nurse that she finds on duty who's fallen asleep to stop them for making the same mistake that she did um, oh and I was told that story <laughs> we spent the rest of the shift going around in pairs because we were all so utterly terrified but I was just fascinated by that and I thought it would make a really good um, a really good uh, basis for my novel but um, so you know first and foremost I have this intention it's a, it's a ghost story there is a plot and then I think no 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 that's not what it is because I don't work that way um, so then <laughs> in comes this this uh, this kind of distraught um, exhausted voice which um, is, was very aligned with with my own at that at, you know at that time and kind of this process of drawing on all of the memories that I had of the toughest shifts that I went through and it's an awful thing to do to yourself as somebody who has come out the other side of that you know you go so I don't know if you do this Margarita but you, you go back into those moments um, of deep trauma and um, you know you pull out well I certainly pull out the, the word that springs to mind that describes the feeling the best um, and, and try to present that to the reader in a way that they'll, they'll be able to feel it so um, yeah, that's sort of the story with with rest but it again as soon as I started writing it felt like a really essential story for me to tell and it's so weird that it has been published during this time um, because it's all about isolation, it's about exhaustion, and it's about burnout. Um, and and as a nurse working in, in in a hospital where we're kind of battling with this every day, it feels eerily familiar to be back in 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 that kind of that that mindset, that mental exhaustion, that inability to escape from from the situation. So I have to show you the cover because the cover is gorgeous. <laughs> um, uh, it's it's John Everett Malays, I think. I hope I always forget the name of the the, the artist, but um, it kind of for me really really embodies um, the mindset of the main narrator, who's who's Laura. Um, it's a woman in despair, and uh, those are the sorts of stories that I want to continue to tell because it's like like you said, Susan, the the un 
unrepresented, underrepresented um, voices. Um, and I think that's what keeps women writing because, you know, men, men don't, we were very different creatures. We experienced things in, in such different ways. And I feel like now there's an urgency to get these voices out. So um, we'll see what comes next. <laughs> oh, looks, yeah, yeah, it's a f fantastic book. I, urged, I couldn't put it down when I started it. So I was so grateful to have the PDF. <laughs> what about your, your book that's just also coming out? Tell us more yeah. about that. Mm -hmm. it, it's Holiday Card is a novel. Uh, what, but before that, I wanted to say something to Emma because hearing here uh, uh, about this uh, going back to the trauma and, and having you know like it, like kind of experience that again it's, it's something I really do especially when I when I wrote I I, I, I write a lot of this kind of I, I don't like the word the word because it's so like um, manipulated nowadays is they call it uh, out of fiction maybe I don't mm -hmm. know if you're familiar with that word but I mean, yeah. they, critics and uh, they they used to say that I do that at some point in uh, not not particularly in the novels but uh, I do I also write a lot like essays like little uh, pieces of non-fiction but fictionalized also um, um, that are uh, about my surrounding, you know, my, my more familiar spaces and, and people and that. And it's, it's, it's really, you know, like hard to, to deal with the, again, the reactions toward it because people always feel like kind of um, pointed or, or that you are like um, using their life and their experience to do your love, your um, work or whatever. Um, but uh, what I'm trying to say is that this kind of, of going back to the experience is something that I really like to to do one to uh, to find in, in the books because i i believe that it it makes a really like um maybe this is not the the word but but it feels to me like an, a very honest um kind of 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 writing or you can you know it's like a very powerful and honest experience when you um find out this kind of of writing so yes I, I love it and i i started your book i began to read it uh, last night and i didn't finish obviously but i really loved what i what i'm finding in it so thank congratulations. you, <laughs> oh, thank I, you. <laughs> um well and about my novel it is a uh, holiday heart is the title it's a, a story about a marriage, a couple, a, a man and a woman, Paolo and Lucia. They are both Latin Americans um, who lives in, in New Haven, in the United States, with their, two, with their two children. They are these kind of Latinos that earn scholarships and leave their country to, to have like a, a better education and, and a better life. And it, this kind of conviction worked for her, for Lucia, but doesn't really work for, for Pablo, the, the, the guy. And um, they are going through a rough path in, in, in their marriage that shows up uh, finally in um, uh, Pablo's secret behavior. He, he has been like having this excessive lifestyle for over a year without the knowledge of her. And he finally ends up with a like a stroke and, and, and ended up in a hospital with this syndrome called holiday heart that maybe you have heard of it it's um it's like a, a heart syndrome uh, and there in the hospital lucia finds out everything about the pablo's last year these are like the first two or three pages so i'm not giving anything up the rest of the novel is um, it's it's something. This is like the 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 thin short line. The plot is the the end of a long marriage. But the, what I'm like trying to talk uh, about in this novel, uh, it's like many things. But um, for example, the the fallacy of 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 leaving hometown to have a better life. That the fallacy of of thinking that. 
that you you can construct a way of or a sense of belonging anywhere else um, the, um, it's about maternity it's about xenophobia it's about racism it's about time that passed between two close people and transform them suddenly well not suddenly but they realize one day that they are kind of strangers or enemies even and it's like a very um, hard um, story you know it's not a happy ending story that i can say uh, and uh, but well the, the the depth of field may be those uh, subjects you know um, that are maybe many there but well there, those were things that really were my concerns by that moment why did you set it in the u.s and in that kind of very sort of privileged community did you have a reason for that well i lived in in new heaven for a while because of a scholarship yeah but not a yale one but i really there's a like a um, community of latin americans in the united states that um, acceded to those uh, to that um, kind of help or, or scholarships and and really think that they are part of this kind of upper case which is in, in inaccessible for those who remain in their hometown so they believe really that they are like more superior superior in some way there are, I, we here in latin america uh, have a word for that it's like being a, a wannabe wannabe is someone who wants to be always something better than, than his than, than what he is um and there are like two ways of understanding that that word one it's the most frequent it's it's the one uh, that involves money uh, people that suddenly get some a, a, a bit more money than his neighbor and and shows up and that and uh, and the other one is uh, from um, like education you know people that that can leave their country to be but because we have this com complejo this complex um, um how do you say like something you you are not um happy with but it, it really part of your of, of of your um, culture, you know, we we, uh, we think Latinos. We think that in our countries we won't have uh, our dreams like uh, realize, and it's better to go out. We go out a lot. Uh, we have like a very high uh, rank of of a, a very high statistic of of people who goes abroad who goes to the United States especially mm -hmm. to to have a, like an education and to have a job all the opportunities that your country denies to you that's like a really hard conviction and this couple represents some kind of, of that because it works for her because he really doesn't have a sense of belonging anywhere or, or, or that's what she used to say to herself um, when when her children there's a, a scene in the book that when her children ask her mama where are we from because they really don't know because they talk in english but they are her mother lives in many countries her father is from their father is from colombia and and and, and she answers she says we are from here from our house and they look around and their house is exactly the same as any house of the block no, so they are not really from anywhere. And well, that is it's um, um, a subject or an issue that uh, a topic, I don't know how to say, that um, it really matters to me. Yeah. Well, we seem to have lost Emma. Are you there, Emma? We lost you for a second. <laughs> Did you want to respond to that, Emma? I was wondering, you haven't really written about, you know, being a Welsh person living in London, have you? <laughs> Um, no, and I, I guess because there's not that much diff. Well, I say that there's not that much difference, but the, you know, I, I I do feel that there there is a difference. But I moved to London for opportunity when you know when I uh, I said earlier when I graduated from um, my first degree and realised there was no opportunity for me, I, I I took I became a nurse so that I would 
always be employable in some way but actually when I when I graduated from my nursing degree with um, my children's nursing qualification there was no opportunity in 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 Wales there were no um, children's nursing jobs so I had to move where where the work was and I always have felt a connection with home I always thought I have to move back to Wales at some point um, but I've been here for nine years <laughs> and I'm not going back. <laughs> yeah. I, like it. I like it here. Wales is, 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 is beautiful and wonderful. And I, I, I really, you know, I really miss it. But um, in terms of, of opportunity and also just, um, you know, it, 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 there is something to be said about, uh, about chasing a, a lifestyle and, and, and looking for things that, that interest me here, you know, the writing scene, although there's a very um, amazing writing scene in Norwich where you are, Susan, um, you know, predominantly everything happens in, in London, but I, I like that because my nursing bubble is so small, um, you know, any opportunity that I have to immerse myself in the writing world, I, I take it, you know, if it's going to a reading or, um, you know, going to a, a book launch or just being able to do um, panel interviews like what we're doing now, um, I take every opportunity that comes because it's so nice to, to have, I, I, I guess, a duality. Um, you know, I don't, I don't have kids, I don't have any other commitments. So writing is really, <laughs> writing and nursing are really the things that that I'm living for. But um, Marguerite, I wanted to say what you were saying earlier about writing not being a job, it's, it's not a job. And, and you know, the, 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 the struggles that we have as writers, it's that, it, it's strange, isn't it? The problem of being published. And, and um, I, I also have sort of a workshopping group and a writing community here. And people really are focused on that, that publication, that, that, that's the achievement that's the goal that's what everyone is driving towards and you know being being there and having achieved that that specific goal I mean as soon as you achieve it the, the, the bar gets raised higher again but um you know they think people think that that's the answer to every writer's problem and and actually for me it's not I think one of the reasons why I have been very lucky is because you know my my publishers know that um writing isn't my main source of income um they know that there's there's no sort of motive i mean obviously I, w I want to be successful of course who doesn't want to be successful um i don't mean that in terms of financial success for writing but to have people read your books you know that's it's really important now that people believe i have talent enough to be read i now want to continue that and to be read and and to tell the stories that i feel are really important but I think there is something to, to be said about um, remaining creatively free because I think once the um, the check is written the agenda is set isn't it you know people almost feel a need to um, to follow that formula that's going to ensure that their, their publishers not let down but actually it's a really really lovely position to be starting from scratch and and to not have any agenda because if you're not being paid then you can do <laughs> you, you you're not um you're not tied to anything and and you can you can do whatever you want and for me that's really exciting because i can be as experimental i can be as surreal as i like because actually the person i'm i'm satisfying is not a publishing house or 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 readership it's 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 who i want to be um as an artist, so I just yes, wanted to, I <laughs> to add that back to you. I completely agree with that. I, you know, there are like some movements in some countries um, that that try are asking to demanding to profis, professionalize or like to syndicalize maybe the the writer's um, job, it, like to understand it as a job. And I'm really against that, you know? I know that it doesn't sound very good, especially in our country, so we don't earn that much money being a writer or being anything, but but it, I don't like it because I think that literature has always been like in this marginal place and, and, it, and it has been like the history of, of 
writers and, and I remember, for example, musicians when they started to worry a, a, a lot about uh, the, um, they don't um, because of Spotify. Well, before Spotify and everything that they won't be able to to um, uh, produce any more CDs or. I, I really have a terrible English, sorry. I can't get into what I'm trying to say. But when, <laughs> when I hear heard them uh, like complaining about we aren't getting any more money from, from CDs uh, selling or the, the, the business of producing CDs, we have to, 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 to um, think in, in life uh, because that will be the, the next uh, thing to whatever I, I say it, it it won't be ever a problem for a writer that because we are not expecting that it's like we do what we do because we are so urged to to do it to I don't know I, I feel that that's the the place a literature have and I don't want it to be any other way sometimes I know that it sounds kind of selfish for some people like well but we we deserve to to earn more money just because we are uh, creating something that I don't know hopefully would be better would make the world um, like better in some some um, way uh, but why you know we, I don't know it's kind of a tricky discussion but because yeah. well I have like very respectful uh, writers friends that really agree to prof professional, how do you say that word? Professionalize. Like, professionalize this uh, um, officio, this, this job. And I don't think it's a good idea. I really don't. I, I, I like us to be this um, like um, workers with very <laughs> difficult conditions and that because, <laughs> that, because oh, uh, what I, I also think, think that writing in, in difficult, circumstances make us like it, it's a powerful engine for for creating for example like rage or, or dissatisfaction i found dissatisfaction is a really good uh, strong engine for for creating unlike um comfortability or happiness uh, i don't think really i don't think they are like that much strong for for creating or for writing so that takes brings us back to the present because we're all in very difficult circumstances now. How are you finding your own writing practice at the moment? You, should we? We're at, we've, we've been talking for over an hour already, so maybe we'll do one more round here. Maybe I'll just give you a chance to, you know, have any last thoughts that you want to articulate, or maybe particularly around the question of what your practice is like in the present, in this very unusual present we find ourselves in so abruptly. Um, maybe Emma and then Margarita, and then I think we'll bring it to a close. Sure. Um, I mean, because um, because of my job, my life hasn't changed that much day to day. I'm still leaving the house and going to work. Um, but in, in theory, I do have extra time because I'm not socializing. I'm not seeing anyone. Um, but it's it's still I'm finding it really hard to um, close off my mind. Uh, writing when I'm nursing it is is challenging anyway but um it, it helps me because it's my you know as I said earlier it's my emotional and, and creative outlet but um we have another layer now of anxiety uh because of because of the coronavirus and um so you know you're switching off two things you're switching off the emotional heft from work and then you're switching off the 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 news and the constant stream of information so it does feel like another barrier to writing but um, I feel as time goes on it's it's getting it's getting easier um, I've never been one to sort of wake up at 6 a.m and write you know for four hours and then go to work and you know I'm not I'm not I don't work that way I actually write better in the middle of the night but that's not practical when you're trying to hold down a full-time job um but you know it just writes in in chunks and I, I think it's it's really important to keep to the practice of writing a little bit 
um, each day. And that's one thing I would say to anyone who's, who's um, watching or listening to this, that if they're, if they're trying to write and finding it really hard, even if it's just a line or even if it's just a paragraph, something, it's those little bursts that are mini achievements. And I think you can look at them um, in, in that respect as, as mini achievements. And also, um, you know, just, lower your expectations that's some of the best advice I ever got <laughs> as, as, a, as a writer or aspiring writer is just lower, lower your ex expectations and then you can't be too disappointed <laughs> that's lovely advice thank you Emma lower your, your final thoughts for today I can't lower my, ex my expectation anymore <laughs> uh, but my, my, my first in, impulsive answer um, was going to be that, that I that I don't really write anymore I, I'm, I just don't have like um, time of my own I am completely absorbed at this new whole situation but what I do what I do uh, mostly is to think, you know, I think a lot, like almost all day long, I'm thinking while I'm homeschooling with my children, while I'm cleaning up, I clean a lot, I, I like, I clean a lot, <laughs> that's really um, you know, a whole new situation that I, I wasn't used and I clean and cleaning makes me like in the most insightful mood ever and I think about what about about everything about you know like uh, the the choices we have made uh, in the past in the past being a month ago and um, you know, I think about about schooling for example if it's really necessary that children goes out for I don't know how many hours away from their parents and I say that's really a good choice of, of lifestyle and about feeding I think a lot about feeding and that takes me to the outside world where I really like I, I sometimes I, it really I find it like hard to 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 breathe when I when I see how many people are living in, in the street and no one is taking care of them they are babies that aren't being like fed up by anyone and and I it's like really so I'm thinking always and and I really think that while I'm thinking I'm writing you know it's it's true that I don't use my keyboard you know that much but but I think and and I think that sometimes somehow that would because it has always been this way you know when i think a lot about something it, it it gets to be like in a kind of an obsession or 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 i'm fixing in there in that in that kind of thoughts and images and they become something some some time and somehow they will be um letters and sentences and that so so i think that i i am writing um so, and you have a long practice of going from thinking to writing, so just trust it. That's what it sounds like. Yes, yes. So I, I, I decided that that's what I'm doing, thinking. I'm like a, a philosopher. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I've so much enjoyed both of your work and also just speaking with you. Thanks so much for all of your thoughtful comments and for engaging with each other in this way. I hope you have a really good rest of your day and it would be lovely to meet you in person sometime. So there's Margarita from Buenos Aires and Emma from London and I'm in Norwich and that's it from us. Good night. Bye, thank you. Bye.